Welcome to IT Visionaries, created by The Mission, your number one source for accelerated learning. On this episode of IT Visionaries, Ian sits down with Chief Information Officer of Okta, Mark Settle. Mark shares with us his experience as a seven-time CIO and how the role of the CIO is changing. Enjoy. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. The Lightning Platform is a leading cloud platform that makes building AI-powered apps faster and easier. With Salesforce, now everyone is empowered to build apps for their organization. Learn more at salesforce.com slash build apps. Welcome to another episode of IT Visionaries. I am joined in studio with the CIO of Okta, Mark Settle. Mark, how's it going? Great. Happy to be here. We are going to talk about something that every CIO is curious about, and that is your advice for new CIOs. You've been a CIO seven times, so a little bit of experience in the field. I'm really excited to talk about this. We're going to do a little bit on role how the CIO is changing. We're going to talk about driving innovation. We're going to talk about future work, maybe dive into customer experience, but really get into the nitty gritty of being a new CIO. So let's share a little bit about kind of your background and how you got to be the CIO of Okta. Sure. Well, it depends on how far back you want to go, but at the beginning of time, so to speak, um, I aspired to be an astronaut. And I was very interested in science and engineering. I had an aptitude for science courses when I was in high school. And I went off and got a degree in geology. And I did that because I thought geologists, I spent a lot of time in the out of doors. You know, I'd be running around in nature with a, a rock pick and a notebook or whatever, and I'd get to wear blue jeans for the rest of my life. Those are my primary uh, career decision points. <laughs> Little I, did you know, we all wear jeans at work now anyway. <laughs> it's all come full so, circle, yeah, right? I yeah. didn't have to do, do all that. But a short part of that story is, uh, you know, I ended up with formal training in geology and had an opportunity to go to work for an oil and gas company. And no surprise, oil and gas companies are, are technology companies at the end of the day. You know, huge computers, seismic data analysis, uh, well logs, you know, tons of data to be analyzed, et cetera, et cetera. So I kind of got a master's degree in computer science when I was in the oil industry. And then I just fortuitously uh, landed an opportunity at Occidental Petroleum in Los Angeles. They'd never had a CIO before. And they wanted somebody to come in and be what they call the VP of IT. And I said, well, you know, you expect me to go out to the operating divisions here and kind of knock their heads together and get them to do stuff. And I think if I don't get a title, I'm, I'm going to be operating at a disadvantage. So I guess I kind of browbeat them into giving me my first true CIO job. And then just one thing led to another. So over time, I've had a chance to work here locally for Visa. Came here in 1999, been in the distribution industry. So companies like Air Electronics and Corporate Express, very different products that they distribute, but still on distribution of one type or another. And I joined Okta about two years ago before we IPO'd. So that's the trajectory. So what was it about Okta that you saw that you were like, oh, I got to I gotta jump for this? I had actually purchased the Okta product in a prior life. So I was very familiar with the product. At the time I purchased the product, the company was much smaller than it is today. So I think it was about a three or 400 person company based here in the Bay Area. And as a result, uh, I was at BMC Software at the time, and we were a $2 billion company. So we, we were a big fish. We just uh, we just interviewed Sadir from BMC. Like, okay. I think he's like two episodes ago. Okay, very good, yeah. very good. So I got a lot of love and attention from the founders of the company at the time. Through sheer serendipity, it turned out that you know, several years later, the head of sales at Okta was a former associate of mine. He was in sales at BMC as well. and. There's some similarities between the two companies in the sense that they both sell software products that are used in day-to-day -day IT operations. And so at BMC, I would use BMC products internally and kind of showcase the value that we derive from doing that. And now we do the same thing at Octo. So I think it was my ability to, you know, support sales efforts and marketing efforts through the internal use of an Octo type of product. And plus the executive relationships that I had with the founders, it was a pretty easy decision to make. And the financial trajectory that the company had been on. If you're not familiar with Okta, so prior to the IPO, three significant venture capital firms had invested, Andreessen, Sequoia, and Greylock. They had been through five rounds with about $230 million in investment. So I, you know, I thought if there's some pretty smart people in those those companies. And if they think this is a good bet, you know, who am I to counter counter? You know, that's a great point. So we've actually talked about that on a different podcast in the mission on the mission daily about that idea of like, let someone else do your diligence, right? Like when you're choosing companies, it's not a bad strategy. We also share some investors. So between good. the mission, so that's that's good stuff. You know, when you took 
the role of, of CIO at Okta. Was there something, you know, so you're seven time doing it and we can kind of just get into the meat of this. Like, what do you do? Like, what is your thought process of going into a new role and saying, is this different from just taking any new role, you know, at any at any company or are there specific things that as a CIO you're looking at? Immediately, I want to, you know, look at all the legacy systems. Immediately, I want to try to figure out where there's opportunities for innovation. Like, what is kind of the thought process when you're going into a new role? So I do have a playbook. I kind of have a practice playbook. The first thing I think it's important to do, regardless of the size of the company, is understand where the money is going. Because you are an executive, typically an officer of the company, and a lot of your credibility with your executive peers is based around, you know, I hate this phrase, running IT as a business, but you really do need to know what are we spending the money on, right? I mean, how are we building our um, our human resources, and are we using contractors efficiently or inefficiently? and you know, do we have stranded investments based on technology choices that have been made in the past, et cetera? So, so I think you know, really understanding financially where the money's going and you know what the drivers are and your, your overall cost structure. I mean, that's kind of a super important thing to figure out early on. The second, which is probably almost equal in importance, is and this sounds awfully hackneyed, but it's building executive relationships with your peers. So I'll share a funny story. I think it's a funny story based on my uh, experience at BMC. I'd been at BMC for about six weeks, and there was usually this kind of ritualistic all-hands meeting where you as the incoming new guy know very little, if close to nothing, about what's really going on, but you're expected to kind of stand up and present a vision for what you're going to do with this whole new organization that now suddenly you're leading. So, you know, I talked mostly about my background and my experiences and tried to relate it to what I thought were some of the issues that were there. And when it came time for Q&A, there was an awkward silence. And so finally, somebody had the gumption to stand up and say, well, gee, now that you've been here for six weeks, like, what's the first thing that you're going to work on? Like, what's your number one priority? And I said, well, my number one priority is to get the other executives to like me. (laughs) And everybody laughed. And I said, no, you don't understand. If they like you, they'll forgive a world of sins. But if (laughs) if they don't like you, like, there's so much that goes wrong in IT all the time, they'll hang you. You know, so uh, seriously, that's like job number one here. The next uh, couple of months is to make sure that they like me. Yeah, it's like when a new fireman comes into the into the station, right? It's like you know, there's going to be fires. You know that we're going to get into it. So at a minimum, if we like each other, and things will be better when when totally. when it hits the fan. Yeah, totally. The third the third page in the playbook is obviously your own team members, and I think you need to kind of get them out of their comfort zone. So you're gonna inevitably have people that are kind of waiting to see whether you're going to gain traction in the company. And what I mean by that, are you going to be able to attract the funding that the IT group needs to make maybe changes that we all agree on? Are the business executives going to want to kind of play ball with with you and introducing new technology capabilities or, you know, kind kind of transforming things that we've done in the past? So if you don't start moving, shuffling people around or giving them special assignments to kind of probe and test and see what they're capable of doing, You know, the guy running data center ops will just sit there and run data center ops, and the person supporting the Salesforce platform will just sit there running the Salesforce platform. And in any organization, it's been my experience, you know, you have about 20% of the management team um, that are kind of change fanatics. They'll they'll get behind any new idea whatsoever because they're just kind of closet anarchists. And then, you know, there's 20% at the other end who are very passive aggressive. They won't openly come out and debate or confront you, but they are not bought in at all to any kind of change happening whatsoever. Then there's the 60% in the middle and they're just kind of like fence sitters, kind of waiting to see, you know, what's what's going to go on. So you've got to get some of these people out of these buckets and really test who's going to be able to work with you to make the changes. So the people part's important. You know, just to carry on, a lot of this depends on where you are in your own career. So if you're a first time CIO, you know, sometimes you suffer from the affliction that you feel like you need to continually prove that you're the smartest guy in the room or the smartest gal in the room, right? And that's not going to lead to some, to very much insight in terms of the capabilities of the other folks that are there. So you have to kind of, you know, discipline yourself to not always be the first and last word on any given topic or any given debate. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that we talked about at Dreamforce was that Corn Ferry came out with this, this survey that CIOs are the youngest C-suite executive. So you kind of have this this situation where, and then then you have the second shortest tenure. (laughs) So, you know, you're the youngest in the room. You're presumably the 
most knowledgeable technologists in most cases, mm -hmm. and you get fired the second most. So you kind of have this situation where it's a little bit of an uphill battle. And you're also battling that mentality of like the ticket taker mentality, which we talk a lot about on the podcast, which is like, hey, I want to be pushing innovation. I don't just want to be responding to it. How do you think that CIOs can kind of combat some of those things or do a little bit of executive jujitsu to kind of push that stuff and, and kind of spin it as as a positive? Change is hard in any organization. You know, we could be in a five person company or a 50,000 person company. And it always, it seems in my experience that certain things have to line up. You know, you need some kind of a compelling event. So the compelling event could be a competitor introducing a new capability. It could be some financial headwinds because of an international situation of some, I don't mean political situation, I mean a business you know, confrontation that's going on. Or somebody's disrupting your space, you know, they're kind of moving in. There may be adjacent companies that are starting to crowd in and do some of the kinds of things that your own company does. You need to find that. You need to have financial resources as well. A lot of companies know they need to make a change, they just don't have the resources to kind of, kind of go off and do it. And then it's, the, you know, so many of these topics we're talking about are well-worn at this time, but it's that executive passion and sponsorship, you know, get behind somebody. Another story that I like to share with people is I interviewed for a job in Southern California several years ago, and um, the last person on my interview schedule was the CFO. Somehow I, I got on the topic of business cases, you know, and the importance of having a good business case to justify any IT investment, and not just one, but like building a portfolio of investment opportunities. And each one, you know, so I, I tried to assure him that I would take this very hard-headed approach to making sure that you know we could justify expenditures in the future. And so he just after he let me go on for about five minutes. And he said, "Well, I don't believe any of the numbers in those business cases." <laughs> And he's the CFO. And and he said, I only go to those approval meetings to like see if there's somebody with passion that can look me in the eye and say, you know, this is going to move the needle in my business or I'm going to bring back more revenue or yeah. whatever, you know. Yeah. But, you know, I, I played, as he pretty much said, I play games with numbers all the time. I, I'm not saying CFOs play games with numbers, but, you know, he said, I know, I know how easy it is to manipulate these numbers in these business cases. And he said, if I go into some kind of an approval meeting, and there's two or three business representatives that have been browbeaten into giving kind of half-hearted support to this crazy IT idea. I don't want any part of that project whatsoever. But if I got some kind of aggressive, crusty, determined business exec from one of the business lines that's ready to go, then I'm behind that project 100%. So. That's a great, great anecdote because I think that having that one sponsor that's going to carry the water for you and just say, you know, you're saying, hey, there's this external threat or there's this external motivation or there's this thing that we need to address. Here's the solution of like, you know, here's the three options of what we could do. Here's the one that I recommend, I strongly recommend. And then having, you know, the sponsor, the business sponsor saying like, that's exact, this is what we need. That's where you need to go. I think another lesson learned about, about that is you really need to nurture and cultivate those kind of people because all too often they have a bad experience with IT the initiative runs longer or it costs more or you know there are distractions that occur maybe we've acquired another company or you know some there have been personnel changes or whatever and if that executive has a bad experience and says you know i was there at the beginning and this thing went off in a funny direction and i'm not really totally bought into the where it landed at the end and you know all those kind of excuses you can be sure shooting they're not going to come around a second and third time and sign up for another one of these things too so i think Sometimes, probably I've made the mistake of taking that kind of passion for granted and not really investing the extra time to kind of nurture it and keep the lines of communication open and really keep that executive really involved. I think sometimes we just want like to check the box. Well, I got somebody to stand up that meeting and the CFO heard him. Now I don't really need to go and, you know, keep cultivating that relationship. But it'll just take care of itself. And that's a big mistake. You know, one of the things, and I forget who said it, but somebody talked about how products that are bought with the entire company in mind need to have or they have a thousand voices or however many voices and i feel like that's one of those things where the business leader in that situation knows that their you know 1700 person organization or whatever their business unit is mm -hmm. they're going to get 1700 people that are complaining about we have to change this again like again we just changed this two years ago and now you have somebody new in the seat that says that you know we should switch from x to y and i think that you know having a little empathy with that of like let's build an app to deal with like 
complaints or something like that or whatever. Just having a plan to deal with the worry that that business leader has, I think, goes a long way. As a further example of the impact that a leader can have in change around technology. So several jobs ago, I was in a company and we were going to move from an on-premise CRM system and adopt Salesforce.com. And so we did that and we uh, rolled it out at the beginning of the fiscal year at the, at the annual sales kickoff meeting, very conventional kind of thing to do. And the uh, head of sales put out a command directive to all of his guys that said, when we have our QBR after in the Q1, I no longer want to see PowerPoint charts. I no longer want to see an Excel spreadsheet. I want you to come in and log on and go yep. into Salesforce and show me your pipeline. Yep. That's what I want you to do. Yep. This guy's name was John, the, the sales leader. So so one of the early, and he would go around to different localities and like have the QBR. The QBR was like a rolling road show where he'd stop in different parts of the country. So I think one of the early meetings, one or, the first one or two, somebody came in and opened an Excel spreadsheet. So he told this person, stop talking right now. Your participation in this meeting has ended. I thought I made it perfectly clear that we were not doing it this way anymore. You'll be given a second chance next quarter. But if you don't, if, if you can't work with us this way, then you won't be working here any longer. So he publicly shamed the guy and the guy went out. So immediately, of course, everybody on the sales force is texting each other like, holy crap, he meant it. Like, you know that thing he told us we were gonna have to do? Holy crap or whatever. So I told John later, I said, you know, I could have spent like $3 million on change management. I could have had like uh, computer aided training, you know, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. like, you know, video recordings of what you're supposed to do. And we could have had like lunch and learn se seminars and all this other stuff. I said, you probably saved me $3 million right there. You yeah, know, that, exactly that one right. thing, right? But that's a good, another good example where, you know, if I had not cultivated him and he wasn't there, not only at the beginning to get the thing sold, but at the end to get it properly implemented and really adopted. And Salesforce in particular, as you know, nine, even like 95% adoption isn't good enough for Salesforce for what totally. you're trying to do. Yep. I mean, you got to have like 98 plus percent of the people keeping that data fresh and accurate or else the whole thing's useless really at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's part of the thing that I think is, is tough sometimes for business leaders is like, I just gotta, I gotta get every single person on board with this, you know, like how many people are on, you know, channel X or Y. Do you think, and let's let's kind of shift gears to employee engagement here and like in innovation. Like what are some best practices that you've seen driving innovation internally and driving employee engagement from the business units? So let's talk about innovation. One of my all time favorite quotes from Steve Jobs is innovation is saying no to a thousand things. And I've seen really kind of two polar opposite philosophies about how to think about introducing new technologies into an enterprise. One I would, I would characterize as kind of Darwinian competition. And as anybody that's worked in a large company knows, the vendors come in with a gazillion different ideas. The business partners, they go to their meetings and hear about cool new toys and tools that they would like to give a try or whatever. And then even your own staff, it's kind of a Trojan horse movement, you know, like they use something in their last job and they've just kind of snuck it in and they're starting. To, so you're drowning in all of these technology opportunities. And again, there's like a certain philosophy that says, well, I'm not going to try to govern this in any way. We'll just see, you know, who wins, like let it all, it's a, it's a, it's a mashup. Yeah. Let's go see what happens. So I'm totally at the other end of the spectrum, which is I think you need to have a, a governance process around this for two reasons, two primary reasons. One is there can be a tremendous amount of wasted time and effort chasing things that are never going to be, be used in practice. And I think all too often, particularly within the IT department itself, people don't understand that, you know, a, a good idea or a useful tool, that's like 30% of the final decision. There are so many other things that have to be taken into account in terms of funding and priorities and like you just said, and end user support or receptiveness to change, et cetera, et cetera. That, you know, internal out of IT, people are fighting the battle of, well, this tool is more functional than that tool. But the final business decision, which is probably gonna be no, you know, is based on a whole variety of other factors that they're not exposed to. So the wasted time and energy, you know, can, it's, it's like an iceberg. People don't understand how much that's going on. Then I think the other even more insidious outcome of the Darwinian approach is people start talking both in, inside the IT group, but like outside to other folks that, you know, we're not too innovative around here. Like nobody, nothing ever gets off the ground. You know, like we all, other companies are doing this and we never like seem to get any of this. And then, you know, long-term that can affect your recruiting in a local area. You get this reputation because 
of the entropy that's going on. So for those two primary reasons, wasted energy and, and kind of a demoralization that can occur, I really subscribe to kind of more of a, a gated process. And I actually think, and I talk about this a little bit in my book, we can really take a lesson from sales organizations, right? So if you think about a sales organization, they start with unqualified leads, they qualify the lead, they find out you know, who's gonna be the evangelist for the product, they try to find who's the decision maker, and then they stage a, a series of activities, proof of concept, demonstrations, reference calls, et cetera. And they gradually invest more time and effort into getting something to be sold. And a good sales organization will say, you know, we've kind of found out early on that we can't even talk to the decision maker. So where are we going to invest in a POC? Like we already know who the evangelist is. Pouring more time and effort into making them an even bigger evangelist is not going to necessarily lead to a sale. Same kind of overall philosophy can be used to investigate a technology opportunity that could be an innovative new tool or system or even methodology, which is involve, you know, cross section of the management and leadership team to be screening these things. And so the kind of organizational construct that I've adopted in the past is to have a, you know, a technology evaluation board or a sourcing committee of some type, usually with my direct reports, a couple of folks from the enterprise architect organization. And then we kind of go through these opportunities and we say, okay, we're ready to move it from this stage to that stage because, you know, we liked what we heard. We made a couple of reference calls and we'll put a little more staff time into it and then specifically kill stuff somewhere along the way. A great example is a storage virtualization tool that I looked at this several years ago again. We had a project where it would be extremely useful. And I think the buy-in cost was going to be about 250K plus. But the concern was once it comes in, we'd probably want to use it on an enterprise level and this will become a multi-million dollar investment for us. And where are we going to find that money? So if we allow it to like kind of inoculate us here, then we're going to have like this bigger problem downstream. And so we elected not to, not to make the investment. So I think that stage or gated approach is more useful in a couple ways. So one, you want that to be transparent. You know, innovation should be a team sport. The whole management team should know what all those balls are that we're kind of juggling that are moving from stage to stage. And then if you get turned down, I mean, if that was your idea for the storage virtualization tool, at least you know why that happened. And you're not just spinning your wheels kind of with no feedback or direction about why we're never going to go off and do this thing. You know? Yeah. You know, it, it's really interesting because I think that having people who are trained to say yes, but the knowledge that they're going to say no a lot is really important because I think a lot of times when people will form decision committees around that, it's like you kind of have the person who is the is the decision maker. And at the end of the day, they're just like, this is just too much work. It's like, I, I just like, I don't want to deal with this. But when you have that kind of committee approach and you're like, guys, we want to say, guys and gals, we want to say yes. We want to say yes to these projects because there's cool innovations here, right? Like that's the goal. The goal of this meeting is to say yes to some stuff and to run some experiments and to try to do this. That being said, like you like you mentioned with Steve Job quote, the reality is that, you know, 99% of these are, are going to get killed at some point. But if you provide feedback to the field, right. then they have that kind of, um, yeah, that knowledge base of, oh, this, my idea was a really good idea. In fact, it was such a good idea. They're already implementing it in two months from now. It's on the roadmap. Yep. And that type of knowledge, I think, is really important. Like you said, especially for talent, like people want to be engaged in innovation and they want it. They want good ideas to go to the top. And, you know, in, in this kind of committee approach, it was pretty hush. What's the right term? I mean, people from any level of the organization could come in. I mean, again, we could have hired a system admin for the storage farm who used a different tool in a prior job. And if he or she wanted to come in and advocate for the use of that tool there, like we'd put them in front of the committee and... And we decide, okay, well, let's at least do a demo, you know. And, and the other good thing about the committee is that it involves stakeholders earlier. Because if you have the right people around the table, they'll go, you know, my guy over here that does network admin, he ought to see that. You know, like when you when the vendor comes in, just make sure that we have a, a chance to take, take a look at that at the same time. That's a great point. Having it be cross-functional is important to that. Do you then go to the business? Like once you've had like the IT look look on it, then it's like who pitches that to, to the business units? And that's always case by case, right? So a lot of these decisions are in the area of IT infrastructure around things like networks and storage and other things that the business typically doesn't get involved in, right? Yeah. They, 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 um, but no, no, well, as you know, the, you have to involve business people as early as possible if you're going to go look around for some kind of an application or a tool that's going to be used out there. The, the one group of tools that really doesn't fall into this kind of a methodology or approach are, you know, these um, collaboration tools, the productivity tools that kind of come like a Slack, in some cases a box, that just 
kind of get introduced by the, the working staff, right? And people just start embracing this technology and it can, it can take off. So I've, in my experience, the cloud tools kind of have their own dynamics. So they're not really like a classic investment. You know, you kind of find out, hey, we're already using several hundred of these things. Maybe we have to get an enterprise license and start controlling the data and et cetera, et cetera. And that's like the shadow IT stuff that, you know, we've we've had CIOs talk about with this idea of like, I need to know what you all are using. And like, you're going to be doing some crazy stuff anyways. Like, I know that it's out there, but I'd rather control at my level, right? So here's what's funny thing. I've talked about this a little bit in some blogs. You know, the, the rules of engagement with the business have changed so radically over the course of my career that now conventional IT is really shadow IT because the functions now have all the applications that are administering the platforms and, you know, the developers, the software guys just kind of have their space on AWS or, you know, Azure or whatever, and they don't require a whole lot of IT intermediary help getting to those resources, right, to get their jobs done. What, what IT is kind of left with in many cases are data management concerns, both in terms of like mastering data, which of these different systems has the correct billing address. That's a gold <laughs> parameter that needs to be known throughout the business. We need to know the one right place to go for that. And then you've also got security issues too. You could have personally identifiable information, you know, that's been being synchronized across multiple systems that your SaaS applications that you're not even aware of. So those the role of IT changes has changed significantly over time. I mean, let's kind of keep going with that a little bit because I think it's a really fascinating point. I mean, you have now everyone has their their credit cards. A lot of these tools are just like swipe and go. You know, you can start and stop anytime. Are you seeing those type of transactions? Like how is that role of CIO changing? And like how, how much of it is pushing the pace of like new technologies and new innovations versus like keeping the lights on now? So again, I kind of classify a lot of these in the collaboration space. You know, it's ironic, particularly in really large enterprises, probably like Fortune 500 companies, um, that have grown through acquisition or have significant overseas operations. You can even have like multiple video conferencing systems or, yeah. you know, these tools that we're supposed to help collaborate maybe maybe are functioning very effectively in that role in a, a confines of a single business unit. But from an enterprise point of view, you know, it's kind of fashionable 10 years ago for the CEOs to start stand and CIOs to stand up in front of companies and talk about like, you know, one Johnson and Johnson or one Pepsi or one Ford, because the divisions have kind of all gone off and spent a lot of money and replicated a lot of technology on their own. So, so it's, there's different dynamics at play and, and it is possible for tools to, you know, there's so many tools that are out there, things for project management and, you know, running up a, a meeting or, uh, just simple stuff that's out there. I'll, tell, I'll share another funny story. So I worked at a company where we had a policy that any SaaS product had to go through a 20-point checklist from our security team before it could be used in the company. And somebody from marketing, they were going to have an annual user group meeting. And so they found an application that they were just simply going to use to register the attendees and share like the agenda and help make the housing arrangements. It was just to run the meeting. I mean, that's what it was for. And so they brought this to me and explained what they wanted to do. And I said, you know, I almost wish you hadn't come and told me about this because I don't really think this needs to go through the policy. But now that I know about it, we're going to have to run through the policy. Yeah, exactly and, you know, right. And I, I'm sure this small firm that offered the service probably they must have been subjected to this before, but they were really not qualified. They, 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 they were too small to worry about probably half the questions that were, what's your DR? You know, it's yeah, kind of yeah, like, yeah. is this a DR application? Like, would you encrypt, do you encrypt yeah. this data? And whatever. So anyway, yeah. So, so this proliferation of tools, it's easy for these things to come in. So you can have different project management tools or time tracking tools, even recruiting tools or applicant screening tools that may kind of grow up in different places. And once people get used to, those things. This is another interesting aspect of the SaaS revolution, which is maybe of some use to the people that are listening to the podcast. When I came into Okta, uh, I realized that we were using approximately 400 different applications to run a company wow. of about 800 people at the time. So we have wow. for every two people like we have. Now, when I say applications, I mean, they're these, some of these were very small services that were, you know. So was I, that paid or is that freemium plus paid oh, plus total everything? spectrum? Yeah, yeah, total spectrum. It's heck of an audit. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well, it's hard to audit too because a lot of these expenses are being incurred by the functional groups. Totally. So it's not all being done through the IT budget. You know, as a, somebody who worked in large companies and had been through many application portfolio rationalization projects, 
And I thought, oh, there's some low-lying fruit here. Now, if you recall, when we started this conversation a while back, I talked about, like, get your arms around the finances as the new guy. So I looked at these 400 things. I thought, wow, I can hit this out of the park. I bet you I can get rid of 100 of these things. You know, it'll be, it'll be real easy. And I should qualify this. When I tell about 400, really, at the end of the day, there are about 150 real business applications. There's data services and other things that we subscribe to. And I still thought, man, there must be some savings here. But what you find is you've got major platforms that are the big ticket items like a Salesforce or a NetSuite or a Workday. Mm -hmm. And then kind of like adorning these or hanging on the sides are these much smaller kind of applications like the recruiting tool or the project management tool, et cetera. So as I waded in and thought, well, I can kind of hack through the jungle here and like save some money probably in the process, what I rapidly realized was the savings associated with getting rid of some of those ornaments, or the dollar value was pretty small. And the political cost of going in and like, you know, hitting the hornet's nest was pretty high. So I rapidly realized that, you know, the political calculus just doesn't work. I'm not going to be able to deliver enough of the savings to actually, you know, withstand the political headwinds that are going to take place if I go in and try to make these changes. No, that totally is uh, one of the stories. I can't remember if I told us on this podcast as someone who's formerly in the military, you know this, but when General Shinseki went to switch in the army from uh, patrol caps to the Black Beret, he was like, I signed this thing. I didn't think twice about it. It just like came across my desk and I was like, yeah, like we want to look more professional, like good to go. And the bad, he's like, it's the thing I got the most backlash in my whole career was switching to the Black Beret because it was, you know, reserved for, I believe, I think the Rangers had black rays. And so it was one of these things where, you know, sometimes those changes that might seem inconsequential, it's like it was nowhere near the headache to do something like that, even for the perceived benefits, because you spin up everybody and then you lose a little bit of credibility. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately, you kind of have the, the thing that sticks in people's mind is like, it's like, well, yeah, that's the guy who took away my video conferencing. So it also it also reminds me of the the George Bush read my lips no new taxes right it's like read my lips no no net new applications we're already at four hundred and right. then it's like a year later you're at five hundred and you're like okay well I guess I, I guess that wasn't realistic <laughs> well that's like the old days of servers in the data center I had a CEO who once told me he said they're like rabbits they like just multiply like I keep you keep briefing me and, you know every budget cycle or whatever and it seems like we had like two thousand before and like I blinked twice and now there's like thirty five hundred. Where did all the service come from? Why do we have all that stuff in there? Let's do a little bit on future work. You have some thoughts on this. What do you see as as kind of the exciting things or maybe the troubling things, the future of work? Well, it is interesting. So at Okta, I have a chance to go around and meet with many prospective customers. So I spend a fair amount of time traveling. And the open floor concept, I don't know if that's the right term that people talk about, but you know, we went from like high cubes to low cubes now to like no cubes. And it's this kind of open floor plan work style or workplace design. And actually, I can fill in some stats here. So in 2017, 70% of American offices are either low cube or no cube. So the stats back this up that we shifted towards this open floor plan in a major way. So anyways, continue. So to betray a confidence. So last Monday, I was in Minneapolis and I actually visited Land Lakes, the folks that make the butter. Yeah. And they have a super innovative uh, CIO. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they adopted the open floor. I mean, Land Lakes has this open floor plan concept. So, and I know that the, well, I believe that the intent of this was to foster more interpersonal collaboration because it would be so easy to just lean sideways or look over the room and like interact with somebody else at a personal level. Of course, just the opposite has happened. And there've been studies done again that kind of corroborate this, but many people, you know, sit there and they have on headphones to block out the distracting noise. And then they do interact with their colleagues, but they do that by sending more text messages and emails to each other, even though they may be only like two chairs apart. I, I have actually an administrative assistant who she supports me and several other people. She literally sits behind me one desk over and we exchange emails all day long, yeah. you know, so it's like, help me do this. And can you get this for me, et cetera, et cetera. So the text and the emails go up. And then in actually trying to get work done, you know, there's this more kind of interrupt driven work style. So you've got Slack messages that are popping up on the screen. New emails are being delivered all the time. The JIRA boards are like posting new, new JIRA. I mean, it's just like a cacophony of stuff that in some ways you're responsible for, or you have some 
interest in or an association with. So and all the notifications are on, right? right? So that's the thing is like push notifications are are on every single every single thing. You have the red the red circles all over your your phone. So it's really kind of remarkable in some ways that people can get anything done. You know, I I remember with chagrin when <laughs> United first started off for Wi-Fi on the plane. I thought. Oh my God! This is my last refuge. You know, like if I take off and in the plane, I can actually think about something for an hour or more at a time. You know, without having to worry about new stuff showing up. So I think the thing is kind of backfired. The whole it was well intended. It has a nice modern look and feel to it. And of course, there are breakout areas and conference rooms you can jump into. One of the technologies that's worked extremely well for us has been Zoom, and I think they're very popular here in the Bay Area. So we found that to be a really easy video conferencing technology that you can deploy on a phone, on a laptop, in a conference room, et cetera. And we have offices today in Toronto, here in San Francisco, and up in uh, Bellevue in Washington. Those are our engineering offices. And then we have sales offices in several other locations around the world. And Zoom is kind of like our you know, nervous system, if you will, you know, DNA background kind of thing. We can always jump on a Zoom call from almost anywhere. And I think we actually, I think we might have the CIO Zoom coming up on that. Good, Harry. That. Harry Mosley is the. Uh, yeah, 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 I think so. I, I'd have to, I have to check. I know we're in communications. He's a good guy. He's a good yeah. guy. Yeah. But yeah, they've done. I mean, really interesting stuff. Also, have uh, really good podcast ad reads. Funny enough, they always do these helpful things. But as someone in the podcasting business, I notice those things. Let's touch on customer experience before we get into the lightning round. Okay. What do you think is yeah this this customer experience thing is like new-ish, right? It's this kind of new wave of how we can service our customers in an exponentially better way. How are you seeing that at Okta? So relative to Okta's technology, we offer different kinds of end-user authentication services. And this is growing in importance all the time. So for those who maybe are not familiar with the space, Okta collects and manages identity information and different identity attributes, and then leverages those to effectively challenge or we authenticate who you are, and then we know what access privileges you have to different kinds of technologies. So we're a gatekeeper, if you will. And in the old days, the whole world revolved around passwords, and you know, once a day you came in and put your, your username in and your password, and then you had you were kind of like in the mall, and you could wander around and use all the different resources in the company. And that's radically changed for a lot of reasons. So one reason is the proliferation of mobility devices. So now it's not just coming into your laptop and sitting down on the corporate network. You also, you know, have got all these different kind of tools and capabilities that are, that are out there as well. So it's kind of hard to come up with a universal control that can be imposed on these various devices and services as well. So what the world is moving towards is more of a passwordless experience where you can use different factors. You may be challenged on a continuous basis. So if you are perhaps trading stocks in your own personal account, your authentication might, you might be required to actually after a certain period of time to re-authenticate. Or let's say you had a lapse in your, your work session. When you came back, you might be challenged again. There's all kinds of policies that you can implement. But the, at the bottom line of this story is authentication is becoming more contextual and risk-based. So how risky is it to let you come back on the system? You know, and then how continuously do you want to re-challenge people all the time? Now, what's interesting to me in that context is the world for years, for decades, we've all talked about making the customer experience frictionless, like it should just just be almost telepathic that I know I want to go check my balance at Bank of America, so it should just like happen when I flip open the laptop or punch the phone. And I think as concerns about personal information kind of rise over time, you know, you see all the security breaches and everything else. I, I actually think you can like sell on security. So I, I think introducing the appropriate friction is a useful thing to do. Well, it is useful. And I don't think it's necessarily at the expense of the customer experience. I think it can enrich the customer experience. So if I was to be challenged because I want to look up, you know, my drug prescriptions, I'd feel pretty okay about that because I don't want to just share that with, you know, anybody that kind of comes along or my stock holdings or maybe my student loan debt. Things that, that I perceive to be sensitive, I'm quite comfortable being challenged, you know, on a regular basis about getting access to that. And maybe you share the same sentiment. I mean, a lot of times there are financial accounts that I don't visit on a regular basis. And when I periodically check in to work on my taxes or something else, I get an email that says, oh, by the way, somebody with your credentials just actually accessed the service, oh, yeah. yep. right? 
that doesn't bother me at all. I think that's great. No, like, you're so, like, you know, yeah, yeah, you're like, this is fantastic. Yeah, thanks you're for like, checking. And yeah. Let me know. Like, yeah. hey, did you know? No, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, the the, you know, I bank with USA and the fingerprint and all that other stuff. Like, I mean, it's great. You know, it's really interesting when we met with Dino Roberts at at Slack. He was one of the things that they really wanted to do is do facial recognition and people and it's like it's too it's too nerve-wracking for people to be like oh we're going to do facial recognition but really the least effective way is badging in in and out badging in and out is almost worse than not having badges because if you badge in and out you can steal someone's badge and it's like even with a photo on it and showing that it's like nobody's really checking that it's hanging off their you know their shirt their shirt's kind of covering it it's actually you could make the argument that it's less secure, even though there's like this, well, you had to get a badge in the first place. But like, if you were truly mischievous, right. that's the way to get around it. So the whole world is moving towards two-factor authentication, right? Yep. So you always have to have some kind of second factor. And there's this other jargon term called factor chaining, where you can use like several different kinds of factors depending on the situation that you're in. I've even, this is kind of interesting, I've even seen some situations where we all got away from hard tokens. The idea of carrying around your little RSA token became a kind of antiquated uh, thing of the past. But there are, for certain people, it's actually a very convenient thing to do to have something on a keychain that they can just simply plug into a laptop and authenticate against a hard token. So it, it's so situational dependent, right? That there's not a right answer kind of one way, one way or another. I'm really interested in how the future of security looks. Uh, maybe that'll be in podcast from the mission someday soon. I'm really interested in that because I think that with those types of authentication, it's going to be really exciting to figure out, like you said, what are the places where we actually push back and say, it's actually not going to be as easy to put your email address in somewhere and to get retarded specifically with marketing. But we think about that stuff all the time. Like what hurdles do we want to intentionally put in front of people to make sure that they're serious about blank, you know, like auto unsubscribes and all that sort of stuff. Hey, you haven't opened 15 emails, you know, in a row from us. You still, are you still there? You know, and you see that with downloading episodes on podcasts, you see that like all sorts of different places. Totally. I mean, the, the other part about customer experience kind of backing away from the authentication issues is the tremendous amount of information that retailers are collecting about our behavior. I mean, to the point where it's semi-creepy, you know, you... And semi is, uh, yeah, it's yeah. creepy. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, so I give the more subtle that, you know, visit this address that bought this thing two days ago and like, you know, whatever. I, I'm trying to, I think I downloaded a white paper from something like ServiceNow and then I went to buy tickets to like the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra and I got a promo from ServiceNow oh, yeah. while I was on the Symphony site and I thought, wow, like how does, these are like two of the most disconnected thing I could possibly yep. imagine, but they're buying eyeballs in, in time. So, you know, storage is cheap. There's lots of things you can collect. I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of, even foot traffic in stores and, yep. and facial recognition about like the, the demographics of who goes into the Sephora store versus the Ulta Beauty store. I mean, you know, there's like we're drowning in that kind of information. And then with bot technology, you can crawl these databases and start putting people in, affin in affinity groups and kind of manipulating that information in ways that I think none of us really have thought all the way through yet. So, you know, maybe some legislation, now I'm in pure speculation mode here, but maybe there'll be legislation in the future where there'll be more opt out opportunities or maybe like periodic like flushing opportunities. That could be a natural extension of GDPR. Right, like at certain intervals, I want you to get rid of the non-essential information that you've collected about me. As long as we don't have to have two upper, two lower case, one, you know, one special character, one, you know, can't be the last password that you've used in the past 25 years. Like as long as we get as far away from that, I think the American public will be very happy. Yeah. If you need a blood sample, I'm okay. But if I need to think of a password that is 75 characters long across 95 devices, I think I'm going to lose my mind. I think here's a funny story. So I was talking to a healthcare group and, you know, they had a lot of traffic at their site, but they also have a large population that only visits it periodically. And so a lot of times people would visit and forget their password and go through the whole gyration of getting the, the new password and sent to the phone. And, and a lot of people would still call the help desk, their, their customer support desk, to get their password reset. So the, what they came to the realization was that a lot of people with the healthcare benefits carry their health card around. And there's a number on the card. So they, they figured, well, listen, we're, there's always going to be people that like don't have the card on them. But there's also these people that forgot their password and there's so many calls that go to the support center 
So at the end of the day, it's actually more cost effective for us to switch over to the card. We're still going to get some calls because not everybody's carrying the card around, yeah. but we're going to get a lot fewer calls than people trying to run a password they haven't used for the last 60 days. Yeah, right? that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's get into the lightning rounds. It's where we ask questions that are faster and easier than the ruthless ones I've been asking. Okay. Fast and easy like the lightning platform by Salesforce. All right. <laughs> Very well done. Okay, fast and easy. Here we go. Number one, what app are you using on your phone that is the most fun? I don't use fun ones, but I the one I use the most is the navigation one to figure out how long I'm going to sit in traffic. Yeah. That is like the most important app in the Bay Area to know it, just like it, how to get from point A to point B. And yeah, ooh, especially with some of the traffic lately. My goodness. Okay, what is your favorite time-saving tool? My electronic calendar is probably the most the most effective. You thing. know, we get that so often. What are your favorite uses that you've seen of AI or chatbots recently? Well, chatbots are becoming very popular in the world of IT to crawl knowledge articles that would conventionally be held by a service desk team so that you know employees in the company can self-serve and, yeah. solve, and solve their own problems. I've, I've seen that pretty well. There's several different companies, startups and others, even established vendors like a service now that are trying to use that technology. Favorite team, sports or otherwise? I've moved around a lot in my career, so I have like a, a selection of teams that I can play around with. But since the Red Sox are doing so well this year, I will have to tell you that when I went to school in Boston, my fraternity was three blocks from Fenway Park. And oh, nice. they used to uh, roll up the page fence at the bleachers after five and a half innings and we could go in for free. Oh, that's great. We used to go to A's games, dollar hot dogs, dollar tickets is the best. Okay, favorite podcast or recent book? I actually subscribe to a series of podcasts from a thing called The Great Courses. So I stumbled on this service. They go run around and they try to find professors at different universities that tell, that lecture. And so I have a kind of a hobby around history. And so I listen to history professors talk about different things. Oh, that's cool. But they have offerings in many different kind of subject areas. It's not all history. Oh, that's great. Well, if you're caught in traffic, so this is really my, the way I get through traffic because I listen to a lecture from somebody about like Napoleon. So. Favorite one day getaway in the Bay Area? Healdsburg. But I actually I try to curb that because when my wife and I look at each other, we say, well, let's just run up there and you know go, grab a bite to eat and maybe we'll go to a winery or two. It always seems like there's about $1,000 worth of wine in the trunk of the car oh, when, yeah, when yeah. I come back. So it didn't turn out to be the little cheap trip run up into the wine country that I thought it was going to be. Love Healdsburg. Favorite show that you're watching? I have, I, I don't have a favorite show that I'm watching. I, I struggle. I turn the TV. So I'll watch a live sports event. But I really struggle to find something to watch on TV that can hold my attention. Final question. What technology are you most excited about? So there's a couple. I'm really intrigued with serverless computing. And I think that's kind of a harbinger maybe of things to come. And what I mean by that is you keep thinking about how we pay payment mechanisms we have for the consumption of technology. They're becoming like more transaction based all the time. Right? That was the whole move from sort of perpetual software and buying something that's on-prem. Now you go to a SaaS kind of a thing and you can consume it based on the number of seats that you have. And serverless is like, you know, you're buying server transactions, you know, or cycles on a server. You're not even, it's not even like a dedicated server for you, which is the more conventional cloud model. Anyway, so I think that trend, it's just another indicator that it's going to be a buy the drink kind of model that will apply to lots of different technologies over time which has interesting implications. And maybe that's, if you get a little more tactical in near term, I'm sure others have mentioned this, robotic process automation is yeah. like in, super intriguing, especially for large companies that have, you know, big order management functions or anything that's transaction based. There's so many ways that, you know, you could automate things that, um, yeah, RPA is cool. That's it for the lighting round. So fast and easy. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel violated or anything. Right. I feel good. Perfect. You can go to salesforce.com slash build apps and also learn about how building AI powered apps is faster and easier with the Lightning Platform by Salesforce. All right. Yeah, that's it. Oh, I guess final question. Final, final question of today. And then I'll leave you with some closing thoughts here. What is your one piece of advice that you would give to a first time CIO? Be decisive. So I particularly am thinking about a, a first-time CIO that's come into an organization. I think it's very hard to be promoted from the ranks to become the CIO because you have to go through the you know, metamorphosis of transforming those peer, former peer relationships and kind of developing. But if you're, if you're parachuting in and like you're the new person, people are ready for some degree of change. They're a little off balance. They expect something to happen. And I think I've made the mistake in the past 
of saying to myself, well, I'm just going to kind of lay low here and figure out what's going on and maybe get through a budget cycle or whatever. If you don't make changes, I don't mean like I'm week two, but that change window in terms of people's willingness to try something new or to kind of give you the benefit of the doubt, that collapses over time, right? And then when you say, well, now that I've sort of studied this and I want to reorg the whole group like nine months later, it's like, well, that's a terrible idea. Why would you ever want to do that? Like it'll disrupt all these things. But if you announce that in the first 90 days, they go, well, that's why they brought him in. He's going to make a change. So now he's making it. So, So I think it's important to be decisive. And not in a cavalier way or, you know, precipitous way, but but don't wait too long to make those changes. That's great. Mark, thanks so much for hanging out. We appreciate it. And also, everybody, check out Mark's book, which is Truth from the Trenches, A Practical Guide to the Art of IT Management. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thank you again to our friends at Salesforce. IT Visionaries is brought to you by the Lightning Platform by Salesforce, a leading cloud platform that makes building AI-powered apps faster and easier. With Salesforce, now everyone can build apps for their organization. Learn more at salesforce.com slash buildapps.